Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us for the March 2021 novice meeting. Uh, normally, I just kind of kick this thing off and I hand it over to Debbie, who's done a lot of planning and, and pre work to get great speakers or doing the speaking herself. Um, but we have a little bit of a change for tonight's program. Debbie couldn't be with us tonight. And she asked a few of us if we could uh, go through a program to show you how to align different types of telescopes. So uh, myself, uh, Joe Califf, I'm the president of, of the Houston Astronomical Society. I'll be walking you through how to set up uh, a standard schmidt cassegrain type telescope. And with us, we have a special guest, Tim Pellerin. Uh, Tim is a, a lifelong astronomy enthusiast. Uh, he runs the Greater Heights Astronomy page on Facebook and is uh, with Lancey and Sky as well. And he's going to show us a thing or two on how to get a, a refractor and a Dobsonian or Newtonian type telescope aligned as well. So uh, we'll go ahead and get started. But uh, before we do, I wanted to ask everybody, if you do have questions, we have a chat feature within Zoom. If you wanna go ahead and, and type your questions in there, uh, we'll go ahead and get to those when we get to a breaking point or at the end of the presentation. And by all means, this is meant to be interactive, right? We don't have a ton of slides. This is more kind of a hands-on practical demonstration of things. And uh, we want people to ask questions. So uh, settle in and we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so I figured I would start. Uh, I was going to demonstrate how to set up a schmidt cassegrain telescope. And for a long time, uh, the schmidt cassegrain was probably the most popular. Now, people may disagree. But uh, I, I saw uh, a lot of people starting to adopt the schmidt cassegrain telescope as the uh, type of telescope that they were using because it was a good all-purpose uh, telescope. You could do some good visual observing with it. People like the fact that you could do uh, astrophotography with them. Uh, you're starting to see less and less folks adopt them. I think more people are going to the Dobsonian style telescopes, but they're still a popular uh, style and, and you see a lot of them. And I've known a lot of folks that I've worked with over, oh geez, the last several years uh, who have these telescopes and have you know, struggled with try to, how to get those aligned. So we'll walk through that first. Um, as I mentioned, we have three types of telescopes that we're gonna go through here today. The one on the left in the screen here is a typical refractor. So kind of a straight through tube with uh, lenses, no, no mirrors other than in the uh, diagonal there. And in the middle, this is a Newtonian type telescope on a Dobsonian mount. So a little bit different, it has a mirror in the back here. It also has a mirror over here where the, the light is uh, reflected and comes out the eyepiece. And this third style here is a Cassegrain type telescope. And so uh, a little bit shorter in length in terms of the overall size of the telescope, but typically these have a longer focal length or the pathway that the light has to travel is much longer. We'll also talk about the different types of accessories. One of the other things to uh, be aware of as we go through this, you know, the image on the left is what we typically see when we look um, at any, any type of object, right? Um, depending on the type of telescope that you're using, it may and most likely will change the orientation of the object that you're looking at. So uh, in that middle image, you'll see a schmidt cassegrain uh, and a refractor type of image when you're using a diagonal. And the diagonal is that uh, piece at the very end where your eyepiece goes into. And I'll show you what that looks like here in just a bit. And then the last one is a, a typical Newtonian or Dobsonian type of telescope where you have the image completely flipped and inverted. Uh, it's also what you see with a straight through uh, finder scope or a refractor. And I'll show you that here in, in a bit. But this is important to remember because, you know, as you're going through and doing the alignment of your telescope, what you see and what you're choosing to do, say, um, you know, align your finder scope on may look a little different <laughs> through the telescope or through your finder scope than it does when you're looking at it through the naked eye. So with that said, uh, I'll start with the Newtonian and uh, behind me here, you can see this is a typical tripod for a Newtonian type telescope. Uh, three legs, it has what's called a spreader bar under here. And the spreader bar, you know, if I, if I move the legs around, does move a bit. And the purpose of the spreader bar really is to make sure that the, the legs are aligned and that they don't collapse on themselves once I get this uh, set up. So when we set our um, tripod down here, one of the things that you wanna make sure that you're doing is, is setting it to a good height. Uh, one of the mistakes I see a lot of people make the first time they set up a schmidt cassegrain is they'll actually set the tripod and they'll extend the legs. You can usually, you'll have some knobs over here on the bottom where you can uh, extend the legs out. 
the legs tend to be a little too high. And uh, I always tell people start with a setting lower than you expect to, to use to start with. And then over time, you'll get familiar with just how high this needs to be in order to, to, to accommodate your height, right? But because, you know, when you, when you have the tripod set down like this and you set a telescope on top of it, we tend to underestimate just how tall these telescopes can be. And I'll show you that in a bit. The other thing with a Newton, or excuse me, with a schmidt cassegrain uh, tripod, and for many of the schmidt cassegrains because they are computerized, the routine to get alignment done requires that these telescopes be as level and as flat as possible. And so an accessory that I would highly recommend is uh, a bubble level, something like this. I'll, I'll move that here. So this is a typical bubble level. Uh, I use this a lot. I can set it up on top of my mount here to see exactly how level I am. And if the, the bubble shows that it's not in that little circle in the middle there, then I can make adjustments to the legs, extend them or shorten them to make sure that um, the mount itself is level. So it's important that we have the mount level. The other thing with um, Schmidt Cassegrins, and this isn't every Schmidt Cassegrin, but I own Schmidt Cassegrin telescopes from Celestron and from Mead, were probably the two most um, widely available, uh, the, the most prolific manufacturers of Schmidt Cassegrin telescopes out there. Their setup routines, because they're computerized, require you to um, set the telescope level and oftentimes pointed north. So if you have a compass like this, I'll move this there, that's going to be really helpful in making sure that you can align the telescope to a, a north, a northern uh, direction. Uh, some of these mounts also have a letter N on one of the tripod legs. So if you can align that letter N on the mount here to, uh, on the tripod, I should say, to true north, that's gonna help you get this thing uh, where it needs to go uh, pretty quickly. Otherwise, in some cases, if you don't get it quite to where it needs to go uh, north, some have a little bit of a tolerance to be able to allow you to move and, and change these things. Um, but many times what I find myself having to do is to actually pick up the entire telescope and mount and slightly adjust it to where it needs to go in order to be um, set to level north. So, so that's the tripod. And with many of these schmidt cassegrain telescopes, you'll see this rod. I'll just bring it here so you can see a little closer. Many of them have these rods that go straight up through the middle. And what this rod does is it actually is what anchors your schmidt cassegrain telescope in many cases to, um, to, to the actual telescope, uh, to, to the tripod itself. And so this, uh, and I'll bring this up here a bit. This is my Schmidt Cassegrain telescope. And you can see that it's got a single fork arm over here. There isn't a fork arm on the other side. A lot of times the designs will have a secondary fork arm, but this one only has just the one fork arm here. This is the back of the telescope. And there are a couple features I wanted to kind of point out here for you. This in the, in the back is the, uh, what they call the visual back. And this is where your eyepieces and diagonals go into. And this is the focuser knob. So uh, if I turn it this way, you can see the focuser knob probably a little better, but the focuser knob is right here. And this is what you actually use to focus the telescope itself. If I move to the front, this is a dust cover. So often when you're putting up the telescope after a night of observing, you'll put the dust cover back on, hopefully you don't have too much to do on the front, otherwise you may end up with a nice surprise when you take this off the next time. But uh, this dew cover or this dust cover, I should say, is there to protect the optics of your telescopes. And, and you can see kind of the shine and sheen uh, of this when I move it down into the light here. But you've got a few main components at the front that you should be aware of when you're setting up your telescope as well. So this glass on the outside is called the corrector plate. And the reflection that you see on the back end, uh, there's a mirror in the very back over here. And there's also a mirror on the back side of this particular piece here. And that's what helps the light get to where it needs to go there as well. But then I'll also uh, kind of point this out. So you'll notice that uh, you can probably see it here on the screen. There are three buttons, what look like buttons here. It may be a little hard to see um, because of the camera, but those are what are called collimation knobs. And, and I'll talk about those in a bit as well, because if your collimation or the path of the light wave through the telescope isn't just right, it can actually cause a, a bit of an issue with the images that you're viewing and it can make for a, a pretty unpleasant night. And so 
When we're setting up our telescopes, um, a lot of times because these have been sitting possibly out in the sun, if you're at a star party for a period of time, the temperature inside of this tube doesn't match the temperature that's uh, of the ambient air outside. And so when preparing for a night out under the stars, what I'll typically do is turn the tube down like this, take the, the back end, this is another dust cover on the back here, off so that some of that hot air can come out. Now, it may take an hour or two, surprisingly, it does take some time for uh, the, the temperature to somewhat equalize with the, uh, the, the external temperature um, out there. But uh, when you do, you get a lot less turbulence in the images that you're, that you're viewing. So from here, I will set up my telescope on top of the mount. And a lot of times you'll find with these telescopes, especially the Celestrons, the Meads, not so much. But when you have the, the telescope sitting on the mount properly, it almost has kind of a click that you hear and feel uh, to it that lets you know it's there. And on this particular telescope, there are three knobs here that I can tighten down that attach the telescope to the tripod. And then once I get that done, remember here I said you have a spreader bar that kind of keeps everything in, in, in alignment. I can turn that spreader bar and that keeps the legs spread so I can't accidentally collapse them and have the telescope fall over and it keeps everything uh, nice and stable, okay? So when I'm setting up for a night of observing, first thing I do is make sure that I've got the telescope uh, tripod set and it's level. I then, uh, and pointed north in my case, right? I pick one leg as my northern leg. And then I set the telescope on top of the mount itself. As I mentioned, I'll take off the dust cover. Usually I'll take this dust cover, the dust piece off of the uh, back here let some of the hot air come out of it. And then this is when uh, a lot of people say the fun really starts. <laughs> so um, one of the most common areas of frustration that a lot of novices have when setting up their telescopes is they say, you know what? I've got a finder scope on the back of my telescope and I'm looking at the finder scope and I think that what I have uh, in, the, in the finder scope is aligned with the telescope. But when I look through the eyepiece, I don't see anything. And so why is that? And so that's where we'll talk about different types of uh, finder scopes here and how to do that alignment. Um, if you can see my screen here, this is what's called a Telrad. This is a zero or one one time magnification uh, device that helps people uh, see, you know, find what it is that they're looking for. And Tim's going to go through in just a little bit and show us uh, some more of these things. But this is a traditional refractor style finder scope. And this one's a fairly large one. It's an eight by 50. It's one that I have on my Mead LX200, a 12 inch LX200. It's a pretty nice finder scope. And then uh, I have another smaller one that uh, I could show you here. This is from Celestron. This is a six by 30. So it's a little bit smaller, a little bit less magnification, but this is something that can be mounted on one of these telescopes as well. And then Tim has some examples of red dot finders that we would put on some of these telescopes. So as you can see on the screen there, um, this is a Telrad finder. And you see those red concentric circles? Those red concentric circles are set out at different uh, diam diameters or, or degrees of the sky. So the first inner circle is about a half a degree field of view. The second circle is about a two degree field of view. And the outermost circle is about a four degree field of view. And, and really what this is for, again, you're not doing any magnification of the objects that you're looking at there. This is really to help you when you're trying to star hop from one object to another, you've got a system there that you can use to help measure the distance between objects and use that to help uh, the, the star hopping process. And so I'll stop here and again, show you show you this device. So the Telrad is fairly long, right? It's, it's, it's a lot of people think it, it's smaller than it actually is. It's, it's fairly long. And I tried, uh, Tim and I were, were testing this out earlier on the camera. We couldn't really get the concentric circles to show up, but it may show up like this. There's a, a power knob here on this, on this side of the, the, the uh, Telrad. When I turn that on, I don't know if you'll be able to see it. The rings probably don't show up. Ah. You see that by chance? 
So you might be able to see those rings that are kind of projected on my face there. Yeah, but so those I can rings see are what we're using uh, to help align and find, find out what it is that we're looking at. And for me on my telescope, I turn this here. There's a, a mount up top here that the Telrad sits on. And so for, for me, when I start the nights observing, I'll set it in this mount, you tighten the screws. And one of the really nice things about these Telrads is once you have them aligned, once you have you know, that, that ring in the middle set to where it needs to be for a particular telescope, it's very rare that that moves out of alignment. So a lot of times for me, when I'm using this particular telescope and this Telrad has been uh, set up to be used with this telescope, there's nothing else for me to do. Now, when Tim goes through and shows you how to actually align a finder scope with a telescope, pretty much any time you put a new finder scope on a telescope, uh, you're going to have to do some adjustment to make sure what, what's uh, in there actually is what it's aligned with your telescope here. But for me, uh, this is actually aligned. What I see in the rings here are what would be seen in the telescope here when I actually uh, view the objects. So now that I've got my finder scope aligned, what I wanted to do is share my screen again here, just so you can uh, see, well, okay, what if I get a new Telrad? What do I do with it? So this is the typical back of a Telrad and on, on mine, it looks identical. You'll notice here in the back, there are three knobs, uh, one at the very top and then two kind of aligned there at the bottom. If you need to move this circle, so let's say you're trying, to align your telescope and you see, um, you know, you're aligning it on a telephone pole or something else like that during the day, and this doesn't quite match up, you can actually turn these knobs to move this ring to wherever you need, need it to go. So if you turn this top ring up here, that's gonna force this ring to move up and down. So if you imagine, a, um, say an imaginary point here in the middle of this, this screen, uh, excuse me, this, this back plate here, uh, the knob that you're turning would move that object either towards or away from that imaginary point on the back screen here. Same thing with the lower right hand knob that we have there. And of course the same for the, uh, the, the lower left. So if I need to make adjustments, then I would actually use those knobs to make the adjustments. But uh, the question is then, how do you make those adjustments? What, what is it that you need to do? And the most important thing here, and I'll, let me grab this for you. I've got a, an eyepiece box, which is a, a typical type of eyepiece box that you may receive with some of these types of telescopes. I have other eyepieces that I use for my observing, but this is one that's just kind of a, a generic set of plossal eyepieces, you know, uh, a good, good starter piece for um, a telescope like this one. So the first thing I would do is uh, take out what's called this diagonal. And this diagonal is basically, and if you look into it here, there's a mirror in there. And what that mirror does is just helps reflect the image as it comes through the tube here up into an eyepiece. And really the main purpose of this diagonal is to make it easier and less uh, stressful, less strain on our necks while we're observing uh, an object, and, you know, when we're doing a night of observing. So it, it would be hard for me if I've got the telescope pointed up in a, uh, a pretty high altitude uh, angle for me to keep squatting down like this in order to be able to see the object. I, it's much more comfortable for me to look down this way than it is for me to look that way, especially with the variance in the height here, okay? What I like to do, and some people may disagree with me on this, but uh, this is something I typically do. If I'm trying to align the finder scope or Telrad to an object that's in here. We know that this is fixed. We know this is, you know, the image that we have in the eyepiece here is what we need to align the finder scope to, not the other way around. So a lot of times what I'll do is, um, and you really probably can't see it in here, but you can actually look in this, um, in, into this diagonal without an eyepiece. And without that eyepiece, you're still going to see an image of something, all right? And oftentimes what I do is it's a really important to, to kind of set up during the day because it's much more difficult to do it at night. But if I'm looking for an object, I wanna find something that's uh, still and stationary. If we go back a couple of slides, I always like to find telephone poles like this. Uh, if I can find 
kind of a distinguishing mark or feature or some object on a telephone pole. You know, sometimes they'll have lights on distant uh, light poles or electrical transmission lines and things like that. Then I will uh, find something like this up at the very top to do the alignment on. And if I can move this telescope around while I'm looking in here and just get a general idea of where that object is, then I can roughly align my Telrad or my finder scope to that object. So it's important to, to get a rough view and a very low power view of, of an object that's still or stationary and then align your finder scope to that. If you try to do it the other way around, it's gonna be really difficult. Uh, the other thing, and I'll pull these out here. Again, these are you know decent eyepieces, but they're not uh, top of the line per se. But you'll notice I have several eyepieces, and in this case, two eyepieces that I've pulled out. One of them is a, I wanna say a six millimeter eyepiece. And the other one is a 26 millimeter eyepiece, okay? Uh, many people think the 26 millimeter eyepiece uh, is going to be higher power in the same type of telescope than a six millimeter eyepiece. And uh, that's just not true. So uh, whenever you're looking at eyepieces, generally speaking, if you have a lower number in terms of the focal length, in this case, it says six millimeters. Uh, and in this case, it says 26 or 25 millimeters for this one. The, the eyepiece with the higher number is going to give you the lower view or the, the, the lower powered view. And generally speaking, that's going to give you a wider field of view as well. So if I were to stick this six millimeter eyepiece into this telescope right now, I'm going to have a really, really narrow field of view, which is not going to be good for any type of uh, alignment on the telescope itself. If I replace this with say a 25 millimeter, and if you have anything even uh, higher focal length than that, say a 32 or a 40 millimeter eyepiece, it's even better because that's going to give you a lower power view wider view. And so you can start to really try to find what it is that you're looking for. A lot of times I just kind of try to do a rough alignment here. Like I said, look through the diagonal without the uh, eyepiece in it. And once I have, you know, that image in here and it's roughly where I want it to be, I'll then take a, a low power eyepiece, like a 25 millimeter, 32 millimeter, 40 millimeter eyepiece, put it in here, use this focuser knob to focus the object. And uh, because it's a, a terrestrial or an earth bound object, I'll probably have to do a lot of focusing because of the night before I was looking at objects in space, the focus is gonna be completely off. And then once I have the object focused and centered here, then I can start to make those adjustments on the back like we talked about just a minute ago. Um, if I get to the screen here, make these adjustments with these particular knobs, okay? So the, the objects should stay stationary here and then I can make those, those modifications there. Now, I'm gonna just ask anybody who wants to come off of mute, why would this be difficult to do at nighttime using a, a, space, a, a deep space object? Anyone? Go there. Do they move? Because they move, exactly. Great, great answer. So there's, pretty much one object uh, out in the night sky that you can use to do some sort of um, finder scope alignment like this with, and that's Polaris, the North Star. And it does have a little bit of motion and movement throughout the night sky, but it's, it's so much less than anything else that's out there. Um, but the problem is if you're trying to look down this eyepiece or at least the barrel before you have the eyepiece in there, and you're not sure exactly how to get there because you don't have a finder scope aligned on it, it can be a little bit tough to find Polaris, you know, a, a tiny speck of, of light uh, that far away in the dark. That's why I, I highly recommend doing this during the daytime when you have light and you can actually find something on the horizon like a telephone pole or something else like that, that you can point to. It's so much easier to do that. And then, um, so, so once I've got that Telrad aligned, and like I said, every telescope's a little bit different, right? So the, the process of aligning my Celestron schmidt cassegrain telescope is a little bit different than what it is for my um, Mead schmidt cassegrain telescope. So we won't go into the actual process of actually doing, you know, that level north alignment, GPS find, things like that, that you find with a lot of these computerized telescopes. But at this point, for all the things that I need to do, I'm practically done. The only other thing I would want to do at this point is put on this dew shield. 
And the reason these dew shields are important for schmidt cassegrain telescopes, as I mentioned earlier, if I turn this around, you've got this corrector plate right up here at the front that is uh, pretty exposed to the elements, right? So unlike a Dobsonian telescope that it's open here and you've got a, a lot of shielding before you get to that primary mirror in the back, your corrector plate, this lens up here at the front is very, very much exposed. And a dew shield like this gives you a little bit more protection. Now, if it's a really moist kind of a dewy night here in Houston or in the south, uh, Southeast Texas area, you're still going to have to contend with dew and you can use dew straps here uh, so that you're applying some heat to the, to the corrector plate or, so that it doesn't quite get to that dew point level. Uh, but adding this, and, and many of these are Velcro. There's some sort of Kydex, almost like a hard plastic, but, but still flexible. So you can put this on here and uh, I'm not gonna take time to, to really align it and, and make sure that it's uh, quite set up the same way. But this at least gives you some, some, play, uh, some space to have a little bit of a, a temperature differential there in the tube, which helps to kind of delay the onset of dew on that secondary there. And that's pretty much how you get set up for a night of observing with the Schmidt Cassegrain telescope. Uh, the last thing that I'll mention is, you know, I, I told you that it does take about an hour or so for the temperature internally, you know, especially if you take off those dew caps on the back to get to a temperature that's similar to what it is outside. If you don't do that, like I said, you're gonna, it's gonna be really hard to get a, a good focus on an object uh, that you're looking at. But uh, what you can see on the screen here is a star. And when we talk about the term collimation, that is when light actually enters this telescope tube and bounces off of all of the, the mirrors and everything else that it goes to, are the paths of all of the light uh, beams that are coming in there aligned? And if they're not, you can slightly defocus, you know, the, one of the ways you can test this is you can actually slightly defocus uh, a, an object like a star and when you defocus it, you can see here on the screen where you've got these concentric circles, they call this an airy disc. And if those circles are nice and round and spread out evenly uh, across the uh, entire length of that uh, circle there, then you know you've got good collimation. Over here on the right, you'll see that you've got a little bit of a difference in terms of uh, the, the width of these circles on one side versus the other. And what that means is that your collimation is, or you're out of collimation actually. So you need to correct the collimation. And so I'll take this off here so you can see it. But as I mentioned earlier, um, and I'll stop the share here so that you can see it a little better. We've got these knobs over here. And um, this is something that can cause some problems if you don't have these, these objects called Bob knobs. So Bob's knobs, our, our product that you can buy aftermarket and replace the screws that come on to this uh, kind of by default. And I think, Tim, you may be able to answer this better than me. I, I don't know if anybody ships with anything similar to Bob's knobs out of the factory, do they? I, I think you're on mute. But I think I heard you say I'm that. not aware of any that ship that way. Okay. The reason why I like Bob's knobs are because if I'm back here and I'm doing a collimation test and I see that you know my telescope is, is out of collimation, I need to make adjustments. These are easy for me to grab. Uh, they've got good grip on the sides and I can make those adjustments as I need to. Uh, Schmidt Cassegrins aren't so bad with them. Uh, Newtonians, pretty much anytime you travel with one and, and you set it up, you're probably gonna have to collimate it. The process there is a little bit different, but with Schmidt Cassegrins, I don't have to do it that frequently but it makes it so much easier for me to just grab and twist this uh, as opposed to uh, what the manufacturers recommend you doing with what they send is actually use some sort of screwdriver or a hex wrench or something else like that in the middle of the night <laughs> while looking at the back here to try to make these uh, changes. So um, very often it can be a little dangerous where you try to put a screwdriver here in the middle of the night so you can make some minor adjustments to these uh, collimation screws to get the collimation just right. And the way that you do this is you just make uh, tiny tweaks, right? You don't have to make a, a full turn, not even a half turn. Some people will say, start off with a quarter turn. I think that's a lot to start off with and just see where that circle actually starts making adjustments. Um, you'll find that you'll make a, a, a turn 
and uh, the image will shift somewhere else. So you have to make those slight adjustments to where the telescope is pointing in order to do this. And then uh, you'll make other adjustments. But the rule of thumb generally is, if you're gonna tighten one of these, you're gonna have to loosen the other two. And it's just a process of just finding out exactly which ones you need to tighten and which ones you need to loosen in order to get the collimation set up, okay? Um, I think David Brown had a question or a comment. Any over-tightening risk? Could you crack a corrector plate? So I don't, th I, I don't think you can crack the corrector plate itself because you know, this is separate from the corrector. Um, if you tighten too much, you may uh, actually strip some of the screws that are in there or the, the threads that are in there. Um, I think the risk really is loosening too much. And if you loosen all of these too much, then you might actually lose the secondary mirror that's on the back there. So Tim, I don't know if you've had any issues with people tightening or over tightening. I haven't seen one cracked. Okay, I haven't either. So I wasn't, you know, you see a lot more of these than I do. So I wasn't sure if, if that was something, but certainly with loosening them, and I know when you're putting Bob's knobs on themselves, uh, they will tell you do one at a time. Do not take all three screws off and then replace them with Bob's knobs because you won't be able to do that. So you'll take one off, make sure the other ones are on pretty tightly, put the Bob's knob on as soon as you're, you know, it's in there and you're, you're certain it's uh, there and secure, you can start with the next one and, and work your way around. So that is, uh, like I said, roughly speaking, how you would get a, a schmidt cassegrain telescope with a Telerad finder uh, set up for an evening of viewing. And again, if you have questions, go ahead and ask them in the chat there. We'll get to those at the end of the conversation here. But what I'd like to do from here on out is pass it over to Tim, who's gonna take us through how to get a Newtonian style or a Dobsonian type telescope and a refractor set up for a night of viewing with various types of finder scopes as well. Okay. So as you can see in the background here, I have a, a typical refractor style telescope, the long white tube. This one has a finder scope that's on a ring system, which you'll find on some, some of the refractors. I'll show you how to adjust that. Um, and the, the Dobsonian has a right angle finder scope, which has the two screw system, one for windage and one for elevation. So we'll go through that. And then we also have the plastic finder scope that comes on a lot of those. They also have a screw for windage and for elevation. As far as setting up the Newtonian or the refractor, I'm not sure that most people are gonna put away their daub. They're most likely gonna leave it together. If it's a heavy daub, you can separate it into two pieces, carry the tube and the base separately, and then set it up. Uh, the refractors, they tend to stay on their tripods, uh, I would say, for, for a good portion, unless you're going to travel. Uh, pretty much the same system as, as uh, what Joe described. Uh, they typically have a, a Vixen style or a Lasmandi bar that you would attach your rings to. So I'm going to switch over to another account here so I can bring the camera actually over to the things and we can go through that. So hold one minute, please. And while Tim's getting that set up, I see that there are quite a number of questions and, and uh, we'll get to those. Uh, and Tim, just cut me off when you're ready. Yes. Um, one of the questions was, does it matter how accurate you are when you point the north leg towards true north? Um, what I've found with some of these computerized telescopes, um, this one tends to be a little bit more forgiving than uh, my Mead. If I don't have it, uh, say, within a couple of degrees, two degrees, it's just going to throw the, the alignment off completely. Um, but for, for many of them, there's a little bit of a tolerance for not being quite at uh, true north. If you're off by a, a degree or two, it's, it's not a big deal. Um, one of the things it does when it goes through the alignment process is, um, you know, true north helps it figure out, hey, this is where I'm at. This is what date time location I'm at. You still have to do a, a two star alignment or something similar to that. When you do the two-star alignment itself, it gives you kind of that more precise 
uh, view of, of what you're looking at. The process itself, though, if you're not pointed at true north, let's say you're pointed at south or east uh, and trying to get that set, throws off the computer a bit too much. So that's why it's a, a good idea to be uh, pointed as, as close, to, close to true north as possible. And then Tim, I don't know if you're... Okay. okay. Oh, we're having technical difficulties with the other phone system. Gotcha. So okay. I dragged the, dragged the scope over to here. Not sure if we're going to be able to see this well. This would be a typical finder scope with a, th with a ring system. Is anybody be able to see this? Absolutely. Okay. I don't see it well. You'll notice there's three screws on a ring system. And you'll have to loosen these and tighten them in the same manner that Joe described. You'll put your highest power, IP, your lowest power eyepiece in your scope, focus on the object, the cat on the pole, and then make sure the cat on the pole is centered in your eyepiece. And then you'll look through your, this is a straight through finder scope. You'll adjust these screws again, up and down, side to side until the cat is in the center of your finder scope. It's a matter of playing with these knobs. Um, as you twist one to the left, the one to the right is gonna move a little. You may need to let, loosen them up a bit and tighten as you go. It takes a little bit of playing. I find that once these ring systems are set up, you're most likely not going to take this type of finder scope off and it will need minimum adjustments afterwards. Then you can switch to your higher power eyepiece, go back and forth, a few times until you're centered. Like I said, this one will generally stay. We also have here a solar finder scope. Don't know if you can see this one. So a solar finder scope, the sun will come in through the hole and light up in the back. And then you'll know when you're aligned on the sun. So if anybody's doing solar imaging, you wanna make sure you block your finder scope. Um, even if you have your protective filter on your, on your telescope, you wanna make sure you block your finder scope because that will be very dangerous for you or your equipment. So use a, use a solar scope if you're gonna do any solar imaging. For the mount. This is a typical EQ mount. This is actually a 1972 Swift. Reach your typical EQ mount. Again, you'll have your north facing leg and you have your, your um, degree marks. So you can look up your sky charts and move your telescope to the appropriate locations using your EQ mount. And from there, you can use your slow motion controls to track your object. Does anybody have any questions on refractors? So Tim, quick question in terms of finding that object, like you said, the cat on the pole. Um, right. Do you have any other recommendations for um, a, a refractor that would differ from say what we tried to do with the Schmidt? Other than, uh, you know, just using the lowest power eyepiece and trying to find it that That's way. I, I don't think there is, but I just wanted to see if there was I'm one of those guys that kind of stands behind the stands behind the refractor with my arm like this. <laughs> so there's the cat on the tree, and I try and get a best I, guess I as it lined up with the lined up with the with the refractor tube. And that that seems to that seems to get you in the ballpark. Yes. Uh, you may notice on this scope. Let's see if I can pull it close again. They have this little adapter right here. This will hold the foam. And I'm sure many of you are aware of the multitude of phone apps that are there that can help you find where things are, like Skyview Light or Stellarium. You can have this phone set up so that it kind of gives you a ballpark of where you're aiming. So I use those on quite a few of my scopes. Okay. 
And then with that particular uh, viewfinder, does that have a crosshair in it as well? This is a straight six by 30 viewfinder. Um, quite often the, the small viewfinders don't have crosshairs. Uh, the next one we, we're using will have a crosshair. Yeah, you can, I'm trying to hold it steady there, but you'll notice that this does have whoops, a crosshair there. And that crosshair yes. is when you're making those adjustments to those screws that Tim was mentioning on, on the um, finder scope mount itself is what you're going to want. You want those crosshairs to be on what it is that you're looking at through the telescope itself. So this is a nine by 50 right angle finder scope. This is basically the same thing, except this one will have a corrected image where this is a Dobsonian. And I look in here and see the cat in the tree or the cat on the pole upside down. And here the cat is gonna be on the pole and flipped. So also it, um, you kind of got to wrap your brain around you're going to be looking at things differently, but it really kind of processes pretty quickly once you get into that. So on this type of scope, you'll have one screw on top, one screw on the side. The screw on the top is your elevation. This is going to move your cross here up and down. This elevation one, the windage is going to move you left to right. So again, same procedure. You put your lowest power eyepiece into your scope. Find the cat on the pole, then look through your right angle finder. You'll adjust your windage and elevation until your crosshairs are on the cat. Then look in your eyepiece again, make sure it's still centered because quite often while you're bouncing around over here, you've moved the scope a little bit. So you want to go back and forth a few times until you've got that straight. Then you can go to your 10 uh, or a higher power magnification and readjust. The more accurate your uh, finder scope is aligned to your, to your telescope, the easier it's gonna to be to find those smaller objects because you know the sky is huge out there. Uh, and as Joe was mentioned, you can see uh, this one actually has some dew straps on it. I even use a dew strap on my finder scope because it does indeed get humid out here. You see this telescope also has a tow rad on it. And I will often go start with the tail rad. It gives you a, a, a quick bulb park. Then you can dial your object in with your finder scope, then go to your main scope. This telescope also has, see that right here, the holder for your phone. So again, you can use those apps kind of gives you a really easy idea of what you're looking at. This is a collapsible Dobsonian, so it has a shroud. See the front of the tube? There's your cover. You'll notice one is removable. That fits on the other one. That's your aperture stop. A particularly useful on the nights with full moon where it's very bright. You can remove that and use it for that. That will reduce the brightness of your moon. Let's see. And your telescope. So, collimation, we don't have to worry about on refractors. It's very rare that your refractor is going to come out of collimation. Your Newtonian is probably the one that's going to require collimation the most. Um, these tubes tend to take a beating when you travel them around. That mirror gets a little shaky. Um, very simple process, though. It sounds like black magic, but it's very simple. You have a primary mirror in the bottom of the scope and the secondary mirror right here. The light goes down, bounces off the big mirror at an angle to this and out your eyepiece. It's just a matter of aligning that bottom mirror so that that Image coming to the secondary mirror is perfectly round, like on the slide that Joe showed. If it's 
slightly tilted, the image will show those uh, deflection on the rings either facing up, down, or to the side in accordance to the way the mirror is. So you simply turn it the opposite direction. If you're tweaked a little too much to the right, when you see that uh, image, you just aim it back a little bit to the left and your circle's gonna even right out. It sounds like a real big deal. It's really three tiny knobs. And I'll see if we can show you those on here. So the principle in essence is the same as it is on a Schmidt cast screen. You're trying to get all of the, uh, the, the, the pathways of light to converge at the same place so that you don't have that difference. It's just the process is a little different based on the type of telescope it is. Right, and it's the same thing. You have three knobs and you just adjust those knobs according to the shape of that deflection. This particular has two um, computer fans on it because it was very humid here. So I use these to move the airflow around. And Tim, this may seem like a silly question, but you know, for a lot of people just getting started, um, is there a, a need to do any leveling and setting uh, pointing north or anything like that with these Dobsonians? So on a Dobsonian, it's pretty much point and shoot. Um, these are very intuitive. You have your handles, you move, this is called, uh, the, the refractor was on an equatorial mount. So you're looking, you're basically aiming your scope at Polaris and then moving your scope in an equatorial fashion. This is an alt azimuth mount. So you're moving an altitude and azimuth. It's simple two directions. So any, just like anybody could point at the cat on the pole, you move your arm to the right and up so many degrees. It's the same exact thing with the dab. As long as you can point to it, you can get in the neighborhood. And then the finder scope and the tell rad is what's gonna dial you in. We have any questions on those? Yeah, we do have some questions and I'll start working through them, Tim. I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to kind of demonstrate uh, with either of those Most telescopes tonight. Things. But uh, I'll just get through there. Uh, David Brown asked, is set up the same for a Maxitov as it is for the Schmidt Cassegrins? Any setup differences for any of the catadioptric scopes to be aware of? Uh, great question. And uh, for those who haven't heard of a Maxitov Cassegrin, it's a, a Cassegrin style telescope. So similar to this, what we see here, uh, the corrector plate's a little bit different. And with a Maxitov, you don't have to worry about uh, any of these screws here. And Tim, I don't know if you've seen a model that does have collimation screws, but usually uh, that, that secondary mirror is glued to the back of the uh, corrector plate here. So if you have collimation issues with your Maxitov, I think you have much larger issues <laughs> than, than trying to get the collimation uh, with screws. So um, I guess fundamentally when you're doing the setup with a Maxitov and, and Tim chime in, uh, I don't think that there's any type of uh, difference in terms of that process. Uh, I usually, with my old Maxitov, would do the same thing. I would kind of uh, point it down, let some of that hot air try to escape, let it equalize for about an hour or so. Uh, the one difference I would say with a Maxitov versus a Schmidt Cassegrain like this is a Maxitov tends to have a longer focal length than a, a Schmidt Cassegrain. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is the longer the focal length of, of the telescope, let's say I put the same eyepiece, this one eyepiece in the Maxitov and then moved it in to the Schmidt Cassegrain. Typically that field of view, what I'm looking at through that Maxitov telescope, that field of view is gonna be much more narrow than it is in the Schmidt Cassegrain, right? So I have to do a better job of trying to really align on that cat on the pole or whatever it is that I'm looking at to do the alignment otherwise. Uh, it's going to be a really hard to miss. And then uh, Andres asked, which one is the SCT with no diagonal? I know I should know I have one. Uh, are, Andres, are you talking about the, um, the image, whether it would be reversed, flipped, and so on yeah. and so forth? Yeah, that, I was talking about the image. Yeah, so if I'm not mistaken, yeah, it, um, it would look similar to a Dobsonian with no with no diagonal, right? The, it, would, it would be basically an upside down image. Upside the down, diagonal yeah. gives us that odd numbered uh, mirror, the number of mirrors so that it does uh, bring it right side up. Yeah, I should know, but I get so confused. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. 
Um, shy, shy to home. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. What's the best way to clean the front glass and mirror? Oh, this is, uh, I guess, uh, we're, we're getting into religious territory when it comes to telescopes. <laughs> there is a school of thought that says, unless your primary or your, um, that front glass, this corrector here is absolutely filthy. And, you know, I see some dust specks on mine and whatnot. That's just normal. Uh, unless it's absolutely filthy, don't touch it. Other people say, look, I'll, I'll clean it any, any time I think it's just a little bit dirty. Um, the risk is anytime you apply any, any kind of material, whether it's a cleaning solution or a rag or anything else like that, two things happen. One, you run the risk of scratching this, which can you know, obviously uh, impact the images that you're, you're looking at. So you want to avoid scratching the corrector lens as much as possible. Uh, the other thing is, these tend to be coated with, with uh, certain specific coatings from the manufacturers. Anytime you actually um, put something on there, wipe it off, you're taking off a, a small bit, a small layer of those uh, coatings. So that's why some people will say, don't ever clean them unless you absolutely have to. Other people will say, you know, I, I've got a cleaning solution and uh, I, I do it frequently. Now, personally, what I've done with this uh, in, in the past is I've taken this telescope and I've taken my other Mead LX200 over to our friends at Lancy and Sky <laughs> to do the cleaning for me because I have no confidence in my ability to not mess anything up. Tim, any, any additional comments on that? Lancy and Sky offers a 5% discount to um, HAS members, which is an excellent uh, way to use for cleaning your telescopes. Absolutely. It's another great perk of the club there. David Brown asked another question for Newtonian reflect, uh, reflectors on a non-motorized tripod. I'll sometimes partially collapse the tripod leg so I can get a view closer to Zenith. Okay, yeah, that's more a bit of advice and that way you can get um, more of that view towards the Zenith. Uh, Jason Salinas had asked, does it matter how accurate you are when you point that north leg towards true north? We, we talked about that earlier. Again, it's, it's important to get it close um, with these telescopes because you're doing the two star or three star alignment afterwards not super important to be right there, but if you're off by, like I said, more than a few degrees, it tends to throw that uh, alignment routine off. Um, um, I'm gonna well, Bill Spaziri that. said, should a small double dashed line between Joe and his slide on the left drag it? Oh, sorry, he's giving somebody advice on, on the Zoom here. Um, Damon Schaefer said, I have the Celestron 8SC, same as Joe is showing. I never start out with it pointed north. Never, ever. The auto two-star alignment works fine this way for what it's worth. Yeah, there are some alignment routines that, um, that don't necessarily require it. Now, with this particular telescope, it has a GPS uh, that, uh, module that I add onto it. And it also has something that I didn't show here, but it's a, a star sense finder. And this is a camera that goes onto the top and does plate solves. And so for this, uh, they did tell me, you know, in particular for this telescope, it's, it's important for it to be uh, level and north. I can tell you for the Mead telescopes, it's even more important to be level and north. So, you know, Celestron I think has a little more, more flexibility in terms of, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, where you're pointing it. With the Meads, that level and, and true north is very important for it. So again, it's gonna vary based on the telescope type. Um, James Bertram said, I'm a noob here, but I think if you don't have some kind of auto alignment feature, you're pointing the mount north to help get you your polar alignment, correct? Um, it's not necessarily polar alignment. Again, it's, it's kind of the routine that they've built into the computers here to make sure that it's at a place where it can start to figure out where it's at, right? So if you do something called an easy uh, alignment, and I know that's a feature that they have on the Mead telescopes, the easy alignment's gonna pull down the date and time with the GPS and your location. And it's going to assume north. And what it's gonna do there is say, okay, I'm assuming I'm north, I know the date, time, location. So based on this information, I should know generally where some stars are. And so I'm gonna go ahead and move to a star where I think it is in the sky. And then you get it close, to, you know, I'm gonna get it close, but you get it centered. And uh, from there we can find another one. If you don't have it pointed north, it's going to go to where it thinks that uh, star is in the sky based on it thinking it's north, and then it's going to be completely off and it's going to throw that alignment off. 
Um, my dad is interested in purchasing a Nexstar 8SC. This info would be fantastic. Well, wonderful. Uh, Tim, do you guys have any in stock right now? We do not have any in stock. 8SEs currently looking like August or September. Okay. It's I know they're, they're in high demand right now. Right. Um, Marlon Sandlin asked, uh, can you do collimation during the day with a laser light device? Absolutely. So it's much easier to do a collimation during the day for a Newtonian, because I think some of the, the devices that they have to help with those don't really require a long distance and being able to point at something. With these Schmidt Cassegrins, they do have these laser devices that you can plug into the back and they'll actually project lasers onto a screen that you've got to keep. Uh, and I think it was something like 30 feet away, or uh, maybe even closer than that. But uh, it's a little more difficult to do than it is a Dobsonian during the day, just because the, the collimation tools for Dobsonians are, are much, I think at least, much simpler to use. Um, for me and for just about everybody else I know that owns a Schmidt Cassegrain telescope, uh, the nighttime collimation tends to work pretty well. So I've got some actually some collimation tools here. This is what you call a collimating eyepiece. This would be a collimating cap, which would be the simplest uh, way to collimate a Dobsonian. The collimating eyepiece also has crosshairs in it. And then we have your basic laser uh, collimator. This one is a Hotec brand. It's a self-centering because quite often your collimator will also need to be collimated. So if your laser is not coming out per, uh, perfectly straight and you adjust your telescope to a crooked laser, you've now got crooked mirrors. Exactly. So laser laser uh, can be very tricky. If you're going to do one, I try to recommend using a self-centering laser. But the, you know, a really true and simple way is to either use a collimating cap or a collimating eyepiece. And we have lots of information available for collimation. If anybody needs that, just give us a call at Lancey and Sky. And I'm sure HTS has tons of resources about that as well. Yeah, we actually have some presentations that we've done in the past uh, that are in our library for people to, to look at that as well. Uh, Don Anderson asked, where, what, where can one get these knobs? I know things are tough to get shipping wise, but for future reference, that's a great question. I, I, Tim, we can order them through Lancey and Sky as well, I'm, I'm certain. Um, yes. I've, I think with these, I got them at one of the online retailers, either Astronomics or OptCorp or somebody else like that. They're pretty widely, I might have gotten them directly from, from Bob's knobs too. Um, the one thing to be uh, careful about when you are ordering uh, these knobs is they're very specific to the type of telescope that they're being attached to. So you can't just buy any type of Bob's knobs and fit them to your telescopes. Uh, they'll have different models for different types of telescopes and even across different manufacturers, right? So this is a, a, an 8SC. The collimation knobs that I would get from Bob's knobs for these are different than some of the older um, optical tube assemblies or you know, these, these tubes here. And they may be different than the HHD. So you have to know exactly what type of tube you have so that you can order the right Bob's knobs for them. Uh, David said High Point Scientific and OptCorp sell them as well. Um, Tom Getterberg said, I have a used SCT that I cannot focus. Any ideas? Well, I would say, uh, you know, Tom, I don't know if you've tried the collimation. I, I don't know where the, uh, the, the issue is. Is it with the focuser in the back? If you want to come off of mute and ask your question. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, haven't, I haven't tried uh, collimating it but uh i've i mean i've i've, I've um turned the focus knob all the way in both directions and it's not flat i mean i'm even just like you know looking at the moon you would think it would be fairly easy to to get in focus should be and right. it's just it's uh just not focusing at all so okay yeah i um i would start with the collimation um, then again, if you can't get it close to focus, it may be a little difficult to even get collimation to, to, to work right. Uh, Tim, I'm sure you guys yeah. see a lot of these issues over at the shop, huh? What type of scope was that? It's a uh, Schmidt grain. It's a uh, uh, Celestron uh, Nexter. Mm -hmm. uh, what size eyepiece? Um, I don't, don't recall. I mean, it, uh, and I've tried it with you know several different eyepieces, and it was the same. It didn't. Yeah. 
Gotcha. Isn't there a mirror lock on there somewhere? Yeah, that was one of the things I was going to mention. On these eights, there is no mirror lock on the back. So the only knob that you have, and again, I'll turn it over. And hopefully not drop anything. <laughs> but the only, the only knob that you have here is this focuser knob. Uh, on some other telescopes, like my Mead LX200, there is a mirror lock there. And to be quite honest with you, I don't use it very much, uh, if at all, but that, kind of, that mirror lock, once you're close to where you need to be from a focusing perspective, people will say to lock the mirror so that it avoids some of the mirror flop because you know, the mirror, when you're moving from one side, side of the sky to the other, can have a little bit of flop uh, within it. But these don't have, the eight SEs don't have a, a mirror lock in them. I have a question about it is, uh, are you able to focus on nearby terrestrial objects? Certainly. Um, uh, oh, are you talking for to Tom? Yeah, I, I, I haven't, uh, I haven't tried that. That's a good suggestion. Uh, I've been, you know, at nighttime, you know, I would first I would try to focus on the moon, to, you know, and if I got you know that close, then I could try other stuff. But I, I hadn't tried to try it like in the daytime at some, uh, you know, more local objects. Yeah, Maybe you focus on something that's about 50 feet away and then try, if you can get that to focus, find something that's a little further so you adjust the focus a little bit to go to the further object and keep moving further and further away until you get close to infinity, you know, looking at uh, objects in space. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, thanks for the suggestion. I'll try that. And Tom, the other thing I was going to ask is do you have the diagonal uh, put into the telescope as well? or is Yes. It Okay. Yeah, with the diagonal. Okay, so that, that was the other thing that I could think of is if you didn't have the diagonal in there, that obviously you know may affect uh, how you focus with certain eyepieces. But yeah, I, I would I, I would take Bill's recommendation, see if you can get a, you know some sort of focus on a nearby terrestrial object, and if that works, then you know we, we know we're a little bit closer to resolution. But if not, then yeah, that's a, a bit of a tough one. That's one you might want to take to uh, some professionals like the folks over at Lansing and Sky for some advice there. Okay, very good. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Damon Schaefer said SCTs have a huge focus adjustment range. You just have, you may have to crank the focus knob more. That is true. Um, and somebody asked, what is the best telescope for a beginner? <laughs> Again, almost like a religious type question there. Uh, you know, if you would have asked me 10 years ago, I would have said these because they helped me get started really quickly and they gave you uh, a good amount of aperture. You know, they had a decent sized mirror compared to some of the reflectors or excuse me, refractors and um, were easier to operate than some of the Newtonian type telescopes on an equatorial mount. The Dobsonians have really changed all of that. And, and for, um, for most beginners, I think a six to eight inch Dobsonian is probably the way to go, but that's just my opinion. Tim, I don't know if you have any recommendations that way either. I think the question would be, what do you want to do with it, right? Right. I think the eight inch Dobsonian is the basic starting Dobsonian. For many people, the 10 inch is the sweet spot. Uh, once you go a little beyond that, it becomes heavy and a little cumbersome. And actually the 10 can outperform the 12 on a lot of nights in Houston, if the weather is a little bit weird. Um, but the eight inch is a great way to start. Absolutely. And Hope had asked, uh, is there any magnification in the finder scope? Is it normal view or same orientation as the telescope? So that's a great question. So um, with these telrads, and I hope you can still hear me, that's why I have this microphone here. Uh, these telrads are, are there's no additional magnification. So you know what I see in the night sky and when I look through this, is, is the same, right? So it's basically 1x magnification. Um, for other types of viewfinders, it really just depends. So this is uh, a six by 30. I don't know if you can see that there, a six by 30 viewfinder. Uh, what that means is the, the, the number in front of the x is the magnification and the number after it. So it's six, six times magnification. The number afterwards, 30, is the size of this lens in millimeters. So 30 millimeter uh, lens there. And that's what that means. Now this one here that I'll, I'll show you is an eight by 50. I don't know if you can see that, 
But what that means is that number eight indicates how much the mag, you know, what, what the magnification on this thing is. So 8x magnification and then 50, and you'll notice a, a pretty significant size difference there um, is the size of the, the uh, lens there in, in millimeters as well. So this is a 50 millimeter. This is basically a 50 millimeter telescope with 8x magnification is what it is. Uh, Tim, I don't know what you have mounted on, on yours uh, from a magnification the refractor, standpoint. The refractor had a six by 30 and the dub has a, a eight by 50. Eight by 50, perfect. And then uh, Celsa asked, how do you move your refractor around? So I guess that's more around how do you operate a, an equatorial mount like that? Is, is that what the question is, Celsa? Uh, it's more about how you travel with it because uh, ah. I, I think I, I don't, I think I damaged it, not damaged it, but I, um, something more of like the weight, something is off and I know maybe there's some better Maybe there's a case or like somebody said in the, in the chat that they take off the weight. Yes. So uh, for refractors, there's often uh, padded bags available and you, you'll take your tube off the tripod and the tube goes into one padded section of the bag and the tripod folds up and goes into the, the other section of the bag. You always take the counterweight off for that. But that's a, a typical way that a refractor would be traveled. Yeah, it's and Tim, I, I don't know a, if you've experienced it. And where could I get those padded bags? Lancy and Sky has those, oh. uh, or they can order them for you, but we have several sizes. Thank you. Yeah, and what I've noticed for many of those, uh, regardless of whether it's a refractor or, or Schmidt or something like that on an equatorial mount, typically the mount itself is, comes off and is separate. So, so when I pack this up, this mount and the, and the telescope, the optical tube assembly, the OTA, uh, basically stay together. Uh, and I can, I can travel that way. Anytime you have an equatorial mount, it seems like the telescope itself goes into its own storage container, you know, some padded bag or something else like that. The mount itself goes into a padded bag and the mount then you would take off that weight bar and the weights themselves and then store those separately. And then you have the tripod. So it's almost like you've got four separate packages that you have to kind of take care of when you're traveling with uh, any kind of telescope with a, an equatorial mount like that. Is that kind of your experience, Tim? Yes. Perfect. Um, Antonio asked, have you ever had to adjust the counterweights on these EQ mounts? Quite often. <laughs> I was going to say. Them according, you'll adjust them according to your gear. Uh, what you want to do is balance. Um, you, so if you add heavier eyepieces, if you add a camera, um, a different finder scope that actually weighs more, um, you'll have to balance that. And you'll, you, you'll do that by either adding more weight or sliding that weight that's on there up and down as a counterbalance. You'll want that thing to be able to move freely, but stay balanced. Absolutely. Um, David Brown said, I use a red dot finder. Mine is dialed in, but it might be good to touch on those as well. So Tim, I know you said you had a couple. I have one here. Uh, these red dot finders tend to come on some of the less expensive telescopes, uh, but they're very common nowadays. And I'll see if this one will come on. And it might be difficult to see the, the red dot through, through here. Can you see that red dot? Yeah, so you just get a red dot like that, a reflex sight. And on here, you'll notice that there's a knob that says R and that knob, when I adjust it up and down, or when, I, when I rotate it, I should say, it moves the image up and down. And then there's another knob, or excuse me, left and right, that one. And then you'll notice here, it says up, right? So those two knobs will help me make the fine adjustments. So, so same thing, right? We get behind an object, we find an object that we wanna to focus on, it's the cat on the pole. I get a rough alignment of where that is. I may look through the diagonal without an eyepiece in it, you know, cause you can standing back a little bit, see that. Then you start with your uh, lowest power eyepiece, usually with the higher numbers on there. And then once you have that, you can make adjustments with these two knobs, one to move it left and right, the other one to move it up and down to make sure that that red dot that we saw in there 
is pointed at whatever the telescope is pointed at. Tim, any other advice there? Uh, they're all pretty similar. Uh, they generally tend to have a windage and an elevation, the same thing. So one moves up, up and down and one moves left to right and it will move that dot for you. They also have the on and off switch. You can hear that. One thing about these, they tend to use the button cell batteries, which don't last very long at all. Make sure you turn this thing off all the time. It will, these are terrible yeah. batteries. Yes, absolutely. And this one, I don't know if it actually had a cover for the bottom, but you can see, you know, it's a CR2032 battery, typical button battery there. And I make that mistake all the time, even though this Telrad uses a uh, AA batteries, I believe it is, or a nine volt, one or the other. So it's not a button battery, but I tend to forget to turn this off all the time. And <laughs> I end up having to replace these batteries often. So that's the one downside to uh, an illuminated type of eyepiece like that, uh, whether it's a Telrad or a red dot. With these, you don't have that issue, right? You've got the crosshairs kind of built in and you make those adjustments. There are no batteries in here that you actually have to replace. These are useless if the battery is dead. Absolutely. This will Absolutely. not help you at all. Yes. And that's why, you know, for this particular telescope, I use it for outreach. And this is the only viewfinder that I have, this Telrad. For the telescopes that I use for uh, pretty serious observing when I go out to our dark side or to star parties, I'll normally have a Telrad and a, a magnified viewfinder, um, or, or excuse me, a magnified uh, finder scope so that I've got some level of backup. And oftentimes I'll use this first to get in the rough area of where I need to go. Then I'll move to this so that I get a bit more of a magnified view, see things that I can't see with the Telrad. And then from there, I'll use the telescope. So that's how you would actually um, use all of those devices to star hop. One other thing I wanted to mention uh, real quick is this is a device called an illuminated reticle. And you don't see too many of them <laughs> anymore, but uh, there's a battery in here as well. And if I turn this on, I'll see if I can get that. You notice that there's a, it's kind of hard to see, some red crosshairs that are in there. So when you're doing some fine alignment and fine, fine adjustment with your telescope and making sure that you've got your finder scope in line with what you're uh, looking at through the telescope itself, these can be pretty handy because uh, again, you've got crosshairs in here that you get with the telescope and you'll have crosshairs with the finder scope as well. So really helps get those aligned. But again, you don't see too many of those uh, very often. Uh, Antonio asks, what's the black barrier on the left? And I think he's talking about the one on your Dobsonian there, Tim. This one? I think uh, it's the, oh, the, the light barrier. Shield. Oh, yeah. this is, a, uh, this is a, a light shield. So here in Houston, I have a street lamp 30 feet from my front door. So if I want to see many of the things that face the south, um, this thing here blocks the light from coming in going into the focuser tube. So it's basically just a, a light shield. Very handy, yeah, absolutely. Yes. Uh, and Antonio also asked, uh, any advice on how to replace the original finder with a different one in terms of how to attach them to telescopes? It's a great question. And I think it's gonna vary depending on the type of telescope it is, right? So, so many of, a lot of the times, right? If you buy a finder scope, they will actually come with a, a mount. And that mount will have you know, specific instructions on how to attach them. A lot of the Schmidt-Cassegrain telescopes, and Tim will talk about the other telescopes here in a sec, um, but the Schmidt-Cassegrain telescopes, uh, you might be able to see it here, have a number of screws where you can attach other types of accessories here at the top. With a Telrad, they actually have uh, sticky strips. So there's no actual physical mounting with screws or anything else like that. I just need to you know, kind of peel off the, the, the protective layer and then I can stick this mount to, to my telescope. But for a lot of other mounts, they will have screws or some other type of uh, attachment mechanism so that it can be securely attached to the, to the tube there. I've seen, I've seen these things attached with uh, zip ties as well, especially on the large Dobsonians. Tim, any other advice you, you have there? No, that pretty much covers it. Uh, yeah. They'll often have, so you'll see the base is left on my 
on my EQ mount, they'll often have this sort of system on the bottom. So quite often you can leave the plate that's attached to your scope and change out the top portion of those type of things. Absolutely. Or if you have a ring system, it's the same thing. You can put a larger ring to put a larger finder scope. Yep. And uh, Andreas made a point, never clean the mirror. Um, I've cleaned mine <laughs> with my Dobsonian. I've, I've you know, cleaned them um, about once a year or so, just depending on how much use they've gotten. Like I said, it's, it's a matter of preference for some people. Some, some will say you can let it get pretty dirty and it won't affect uh, the images that you're seeing. Other people like to clean them before every star party. Um, Jason Salinas had asked, how about a makeup brush uh, to, to clean some of these devices? It's a great question. I know uh, there are some, some brushes, not necessarily makeup brush, but camel hair type brushes and whatnot that people will use to lightly dust the, the uh, optics of a telescope. Tim, what are your thoughts on using those? Makeup brushes are good. We generally start with a, an air blower first. We try we not to use compressed air, but just typical your bulb syringe and blow off any big particles. And then you can use those fine brushes from there if you need to. I'm sorry for all the noise that I'm making here, but this is, this is one of those air bulbs that Tim was talking about, right? So that's what I was making the noise for. And these, you just, you squeeze them. You can probably hear it in the microphone here. You squeeze them and it'll blow some air onto the surface. And that's a good way of removing any excess dust that's not kind of stuck on uh, because of dew or anything else like that before trying a brush or anything else like that. But I would always start, as, as Tim said, with something like this to try to remove excess dust and debris off of an optical surface. I always start with the least, least abrasive thing. Absolutely. Um, question, I bought an EVO 925 delivered right before the storm and don't think it will, I will leave it installed in my backyard all the time. So I assume I have to use the red dot finder for alignment every single time I set it up. Yeah, so if you're moving from one location to another, uh, Srinivas, yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, the red dot finders are much like the Telrad. So once you have it uh, set for windage and, and elevation and whatnot, they tend to hold pretty true, uh, but I've found that I've had to make minor adjustments to them every now and then. They don't hold quite as true as the Telrads do, but uh, it's not like putting a, a, a finder scope like this on where I've got the six different screws and I've got to make those adjustments every time. Tim, your thoughts? That's about the same, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, also, do you use any UHC filters as a permanent setup with your diagonal? Uh, Srinivas had asked that question as well. So UHC is an ultra high contrast filter. Uh, do you use that as a permanent setup with your diagonal? Uh, Srinivas, just given kind of the nature and the variance of the places that I observe, I don't have it permanently mounted. I guess it just depends on the situation. Um, so, you know, the answer for me is no, Tim. I don't know if you have any kind of permanent location. Uh, for I don't have anything permanent. Um, I find that against LED lights, they're not that effective anyway. Um, so I don't, I don't really use them all that much. Yeah, yeah. Um, a lot of people saying they, they're fans of the red dot finders. And again, you know, it's not just cheap telescopes that come with these, you know, the EVOs, the 9.25 inch uh, telescopes come with them. Some of the 10 inch meads, I believe come with them now. Uh, Chris Moore said, asked, Joe, does your mount track once it goes to an object? Uh, it's a great question. Uh, if, if I'm using the go-to feature of this telescope, then it does track. If I'm just using the hand paddle to move it manually to a location, uh, it doesn't have the understanding or knowledge of where I'm at to start tracking. So uh, if I'm using GoTo and I've done the proper alignment with it beforehand, the go, you know, the GoTo's are, are spot on, it'll actually track the object from there on out. Um, Anshuman uh, Karthik asks, is there any way I can feel a real telescope? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Lansing Sky is open and, uh, you know, they have some telescopes in, inside there. Um, if you can't make it out to Lansing and Sky and if you're a member of the Houston Astronomical Society, we also have a loaner telescope program. That's a great way to, to feel a real telescope. Uh, Don said some makeup brushes or natural hair products such as camel hair. Yeah, uh, what I hear most often from a re uh, recommendation standpoint is that you do use camel hair brushes for those. 
Now I will admit I have a camel hair brush and I didn't store it properly. And one time went to go brush off a little bit of the dust on the corrector plate. I believe it was this telescope and noticed that it left some streaks. So the thing that you have to be careful about is if it does come in contact with anything else, even your fingers, right? Because you can leave some oils on the, on the end of those camel hair brushes. It can transfer that oil onto uh, whatever surface that you're trying to clean there. Okay. And Martiel asked, uh, what is the best way to clean eyepieces? So I know that the opinions vary widely on this one. You know, the, one of the interesting things I'd heard, uh, there's a gentleman by the name of Al Nagler and Al Nagler was the original design, designer of the Teleview eyepieces, which are considered to be the Rolls Royces of eyepieces, I guess, uh, out there. And he says he just uses alcohol wipes and, and wipes those eyepieces clean every time. Uh, some people kind of take the same approach that if it's not affecting the optical view, I, I, they won't touch them. Um, I've heard from others that just a little lens wipe, you know, some, something that you would use to clean your eyeglasses uh, is, is a good place to start. Tim, I don't know if you have any uh, recommendations. I'll, I'll pull something else that I've got here while you're making uh, that comment. Uh, I'm pretty much in the same, same boat. I don't clean them unless they're dirty or unless we're doing outreach, which nobody's really doing anymore. My general, always first, always the first step is the blower. That generally takes care of most of the stuff. It's generally dust that settled on the eyepiece unless somebody's touched it. And in that case, I use the optical alcohol wipes. Yeah. So Jim, you do a lot of outreach and obviously with COVID, people aren't looking through the eyepieces so much. I did a lot of outreach with this and this eyepiece here was actually pretty much my go-to um, outreach eyepiece. And after a night of observing, you can find these pins. Uh, this, is a, this one is made by Nikon, but these pins have kind of dual sides. There's a slider here. If I slide it up, a brush comes out and you can actually use the brush to lightly dust off uh, some of the you know, pieces of dust or whatever else may have accumulated on the eyepiece. And on the other side, you know, it's, it's capped. I took the cap off, but there's this carbon. It's, it's like a felt, a piece of felt that has carbon on it. And people swear up and down by this. You can just make slight circles, you know, around the uh, eyepiece lenses to kind of get rid of any excess oils and whatnot. The thing you want to be careful about is anytime you're applying pressure to an eyepiece or an optical surface and making those movements is that if there's any dust, dirt, grime, grit, anything like that, you're going to be grinding that across the surface of that, um, that optical uh, piece. So you want to make sure if you're going to do that, that you're absolutely certain you've gotten rid of at least all of the large pieces of dust, dirt, and debris before doing it. Uh, Joe? Yes. Um, as far as cleaning the eyepieces, we have been using some Zeiss lens cleaner we bought at Walmart. Really? That, and then spray that on there, and then use Kleenex, plain Kleenex, not- Plain Kleenex, plain unscented, lotion. right? Unscented, unlotioned, just plain old Kleenex. Yeah. And we use that to clean the eyepieces with. And, just get, this, and just get this Zeiss at, at Walmart. Okay, Z-E-I-S-S, -S, correct? Like the uh, optical company? Yes, exactly. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that uh, advice, Steve. All right, we've got uh, another few minutes here. Does anybody have any additional questions they wanna come off mute? I know somebody had asked twice and I need to go back to it. Uh, somebody was really happy with a product that they purchased from you, Tim. Um, they wanted you to mention or talk about the crosshairs eyepiece that you sold uh, them. So that was James Burcham. It's Tim, pretty much you uh, what you, you, what you had showed earlier. Okay. It's an illuminated crosshair reticle. Uh, what that does is allows you to align that much better because saying you're going to get the cat in the center of the eyepiece isn't exactly as easy as it thinks because maybe a little off to the right or the left. An illuminated crosshair reticle is going to get you dead center in that eyepiece. Absolutely. So it's just a matter of uh, an additional adjustment. I yep. know often um, if I'm trying to find Mars in the center of the eyepiece, you can be off a millimeter or two on either side. And, and by the time you look through the telescope, it's way off. So yeah. this, just this one happens to be a nine out. millimeter eyepiece. So, you know, depending on the telescope and, and something like this, that's a, a decent amount of magnification that I get out of it. 
which is something that you want when you're using um, you know, a crosshair in there, right? If you've got the crosshairs, you'll be able to get to what you want. But um, if you're trying to find an object first, start off with a, a, a lower powered eyepiece and then switch to the illuminated reticle. And that's when you can get that fine tuning of, of that alignment there, okay? Uh, Celsa asks, I looked up padded bags and Land, Sea and Sky website, couldn't find them. How do I search for them? They may not be on the online catalog there. You might have to come in, huh? Or, or talk to somebody on the phone, Tim? Yeah, just give us a call. To, I'll, I'll actually be there tomorrow or somebody uh, else can help you. Just give us a call and I can help you find the right product for your scope. Yeah. And then uh, Andrew asks, what's the average cost for having glass on scopes professionally cleaned? Reflector different than refractor? It's uh, basically on a per scope basis. Somewhere more. I don't remember how much I paid for, for this one in my 12 inch, uh, but, but again, the size of the telescope will determine uh, how much the cost is. Uh, how many additional optical pieces there are. You know, for me, it was an eight inch Schmidt Cassegrain and a 12 inch Schmidt Cassegrain. So same types of telescopes. One was just larger than the other one and the 12, one, uh, the 12 inch was a little more expensive than the eight inch. But I, I don't, I, I can't remember. I apologize what the cost was off the top of my head. Um, Bill Paulini asked a direct message. Saturday has a novice lab. Is that available to everyone? And how do I get info on it? So a uh, great question. The novice lab is available to any member of the Houston Astronomical Society. And uh, Bill, you can send me an email at uh, uh, Joe K, J-O-E-K at astronomyhouston.org and I'll be glad to answer that for you. Okay. I think we've gotten to the end of the questions. I apologize, I've gone through them quickly, but again, I wanted to give anybody who wanted to come off mute uh, an opportunity to do so now and ask questions they may have. Going once, going twice. All right. Well, hey, Tim, I, I really appreciate you joining us tonight, uh, showing us how to get uh, the two telescopes, the two types of telescopes set up for a night of observing. Uh, like I said, this is an area we hear from a lot of novices where they have some challenges, whether it's you know because of focus or not getting the finder scopes uh, properly aligned. I, I will say, from my experience at least, the finder scope issue is probably the most common cause of a frustrating night of observing or non-observing for, for a novice. So I uh, appreciate you walking through that process with us and, and helping us get a better understanding of that. Um, any last words? We can find you over at Lancy and Sky and uh, I believe online on Facebook at uh, Greater Heights Astronomy as well. You run a, a yes. page there. And as, as someone mentioned, Another typical thing is SETs in the max, they tend to have a really long focal range. Yes. So you may have to do a lot more turning than you would on a dog, which more or less has a, a small uh, focus travel. So don't be afraid to try that. Yeah, crank away at that, uh, that focus tube. Tim, again, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Really appreciate your time and your knowledge and your expertise and sharing all of that with us. And we will see you all tomorrow night. Thank you. Have a good night.